Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, which for me is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I acknowledge that these are stolen lands and that sovereignty was never ceded. I would also like to acknowledge the people of the lands on which you are all situated on as well. I'd like to welcome you all to our Sidron seminar titled Transitional Justice from the Bottom Up and Dean Women's Engagement with Memory Making and Reparations in Peru, presented by Gabriela, Gabriela Tavara. Gabriela is a community psychologist and assistant professor at the psychology department of the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. Her research focuses on working through participatory methodologies and Indigenous communities, particularly women, who are oppressed by diverse forms of structural violence and the legacies of colonization. Before our seminar begins, I'd like to remind everyone to leave any questions or comments that you have in the chat, and we'll leave about 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the presentation for these to be addressed. I'd also like to let everyone know that this seminar will be recorded and available for public viewing on the Sidron website at www.communityidentity.com.au. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Gabriella. Hi, Roshani, and hi, Chris, for the invitation. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and be able to share the presentation of this study that I've recently finished uh, writing um, and hopefully will get published soon. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so yeah, I'll start sharing my screen and um, tell you a little bit more about it. Okay. Can you see my screen correctly and hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So um, as Roshani said, uh, I the title of this presentation is Andean Women's Engagement with Reparations and Memory Making in Post-Conflict Peru. Um, and I would like to start with some background about what motivated me to, to do this study. So back in 2003, um, the Truth Commission in Peru delivered its final report. And I was an undergrad student back then and attended the public event in which this report was presented. I couldn't find a picture of that day, but on the left, on the upper left, is a picture of when that um, the, the report, the final report was presented in Ayacucho, which is a region that was most affected by the conflict. And in general, when I look back at those years, I remember that it was a time in which there was a lot of excitement and expectation and even a sense of satisfaction and pride in the country because the transitional justice process was starting. And also a lot of studies were started to be conducted in those years in the Andean communities that were most affected by the conflict, trying to recover the stories of the war. However, um, some years later, when I finished the university and started working and actually had the opportunity to go to do field work in some of these communities, I noted that the way that they approached the armed conflict and spoke about it was quite different than what I had perceived in Lima. Um, which was affected, but to a different extent. So this study partly responds to, to trying to, to close that gap to better understand how Andean women in particular are interfacing with transitional justice processes that have been taking place in Peru in the past two decades. And here you can see pictures of a memorial site in the bottom left in Lima and the Andean community in which I worked um, is in the upper right. And another Andean community in which I work, though not from this process, is in the bottom left. No, sorry, bottom right. Um, so a little bit about the context of the Peruvian armed conflict. Um, this conflict took place in a society that has historically marginalized indigenous communities, such as Andean campesinos. And um, I like using the word campesinos, that means peasant in Spanish because that is the word that the, these communities use to, to name themselves many times in Peru. Um, and they have been excluded to a great extent from many political, social, and economic spheres of society. Um, so in this scenario is that the Shining Path, the subversive group responsible for most of the deaths and the conflict, declares war on the Peruvian state in the 1980s. They had this discourse that denounced social injustice. So they initially had some support from people from, from the Andes, from these Andean communities. 
In fact, many members of these communities joined the ranks, especially in the area where this project took place. However, soon after the conflict started, the Shining Path started displaying actions of enormous violence and brutality, and they killed many people in the Andes, sometimes massacring entire villages. Um, and in response, the armed forces entered these communities using a very bloody counterinsurgent strategy that targeted directly many people um, who were suspected of being from the Shining Path, um, met some of the members of the community. Um, so as a result, the armed forces also committed several killings, disappearances, and other violations of human rights. Uh, now, there have been some studies and also the Truth Commission in a way, um, portrays Andean people as trapped between two fires, but more and more ethnographic research that is being conducted or that has been conducted in these communities explains how it seems that in many communities, people actually engaged in both sides of the conflict in very complex ways, sometimes supporting one side or the other, sometimes probably out of true conviction, but other times more as a survival strategy. So, in the years following the, the conflict, the transitional justice process started in Peru through initially the formation of a truth commission and this commission recommended the formation of a reparations program. So in 2006, this, 2006, this program um, was formed in Peru to provide redress to the victims of the conflict through several types of reparation. In fact, there are about, I think, seven types of reparation, but in this project, I'm only focusing on two which are uh, individual economic reparations and collective reparations. So economic reparations basically consist in the delivery of an amount of money, about 3,000 US dollars, to the victims of victims or family members of those who have been killed, disappeared, who are victims of sexual violence, or those who have resulted physically or mentally disabled as a result of the conflict. Collective reparations are given to campesino communities as a whole, that have been affected by conflict, mostly through some form of productive or development project, but also through infrastructure projects. Now, despite the progress that has been made in the reparations program throughout these years, there have been several critiques and important debates in this program. Um, so for example, although the program included both victims of the subversive groups and of the armed forces, it defined victimhood in a very narrow way, excluding, for example, former members of subversive groups, but not members of the armed forces. So this measure in a way led to creating some form of hierarchy of victims in which those who are victims of the subversive groups are usually seen as more deserving of reparations compared to those who have been victims of the armed forces. Um, then another set of critiques uh, to the reparation program has to do with how it has been implemented, um, given that it has taken too long and that the process to register as a victim and access reparations is very bureaucratic. And also others who critique the program have explained how the way in which the state is granting reparation is very cold and lacking any acknowledgement of, of true responsibility. Um, all in the years following the conflict, there have been several memory making initiatives, remembrance initiatives that have been mostly promoted by the Truth Commission in alliance with human rights organizations and sometimes victims associations as well. Um, among these initiatives, for example, they have been, there have been memorials that have been built, public events to recognize the victims. Um, but these remembrance initiatives have found a lot of pushback, mostly from group, groups that are close to the military and also groups to are close to right wing political parties. Um, but what I think is most noteworthy is that most of the time, the voices and opinions of people from these communities that were most affected by the armed conflict are usually not part of these debates. Um, so in light of this scenario, um, is that I proposed this study that had the focus to understand how a group of Indian women from a town deeply impacted by the armed conflict were experiencing and engaging with processes of reparations and remembrance that were taking place in their community. So now a little bit about um, the study. So this study, which took place in an Indian community called Huancasancos, was part of a 
broader participatory action research project that I conducted for my doctoral dissertation between 2016 and 2017. And Juan Casancos is in Ayacucho, that is the region most affected by the conflict, as I mentioned previously. And in fact, the Shining Path started infiltrating this community in the late 70s through the local high school where many school teachers tried to attract new members, mostly young students. And in the early 80s, the Shining Path openly took control over the town. They killed many community authorities and community members. And after a few months, the military arrived uh, at Huanca Sancos and entered into confrontations with the Shining Path. Now, it's important to mention here that at some point around these months, um, many community members who had joined the Shining Path repented and were forgiven and reinserted into the community. Um, also, after this confrontation, a military base was installed and remained for about a decade in the community when the conflict started like winding down. Um, so in terms of transitional justice measures, um, a registry booth for victims have been, has been open in this town, mostly due to the support of a human rights NGO that was working in this area. And this town, in this town, around 500 individual victims have been registered and the community as a collective has also been recognized as a collective victim uh, in the reparations program. So they have received about, and they have been implemented um, about seven reparations projects, mostly through productive projects that I'm gonna mention a little bit in the findings. To my knowledge, this community hasn't promoted um, any remembrance or memory making initiative. However, there is a helicopter uh, that you can see in the picture in, in the picture to, to your right in the bottom right um, that is placed in, the, in a hill in a, in a small hill in the middle of the community and that is visible from practically everywhere. Um, and I'll speak a little bit of, about what I think this elephant, this helicopter means for for people in this community. So, a little bit about how I, I entered the community. Um, it was for a professional acquaintance that was working there at that time that introduced me to a group of women who were in the process of forming a knitting association. So I come as a doctoral student interested in trying to understand how Indian communities are dealing with processes of reparation and remembrance. And this group of women that I, that I met were interested in forming a knitting association. Um, but they explained to me, and this really caught my attention, that one of their greatest challenges was the mistrust that they perceived among community members. So together we agreed on working on a participatory action research process with the broader goal of understanding how women from the association were facing the psychosocial sequels of the armed conflict as they sought to work together as a collective, and also how they were engaging with processes of memory and reparation. So I conducted about 18 months of fieldwork in Huancasancos, and during this time I made a lot of ethnographic observations, I participated in a lot of the daily activities of the community and with the women, and you'll see pictures that I took when I was there throughout my PowerPoint because I wasn't really sure what pictures to put, so I try to make an, like a correct match between the text and the pictures, but you'll see them throughout the presentation. And I also facilitated several collective workshops with the women. I conducted interviews with 12 of about a group of 20 women. And these individual interviews constitute the main data of the study. Um, although they are complemented with specific information about the workshops and my observations, my ethnographic observations. Um, so the interviews explored overall, among other topics, the challenges that women were finding when they were forming the association, particularly the challenges related to mistrust and interpersonal difficulties. And they also explore how the women were perceiving previous collective work experiences in the town, including collective reparation projects. I didn't ask directly about the armed conflict, um, but many of the experiences um, related to the conflict emerge in the interviews. So, in terms of the findings um, about reparations, um, I'm gonna go first through, for example, economic reparations. Um, in this study, only one of the participants had received economic reparations. The rest of the participants had mostly heard about the program, but not through official means. So they really didn't have a clear, I, 
clear information about the process of registering as victims, nor did they understand the criteria used by the reparations program to determine who could be considered a victim and who couldn't. So this created a sense of mistrust towards the whole process, which many of, of the participants believed to be unfair. Also, many of them knew people who had been injured as a result of the conflict, including family members who had not received anything. Um, for example, in this quote, a participant says, when my mom was pregnant, she received a bullet in her breast. Until now, she hasn't received one sol. Many mentioned also that they and their family members felt as victims because they survived the conflict and witnessed the horrors that occurred in their community. And partly because of this, the women expressed a feeling, certain feelings of resentment towards people in the town who had received reparations. Um, so I think that in a way in communities um, such as this Andean community where the lines between victims and perpetrators are sometimes a little bit blurry and where there are high levels of poverty, um, bringing a monetary resource and only granting it to some victims seems to have reinforced a uh, fragmentation of the community ties that were probably already hindered and damaged by the conflict, but that nonetheless were reinforced by the, the difficulties in the economic reparation distribution. Um, in terms of women's access to reparation, um, the participants, participants explained that many in the town were finding difficulties, particularly when it came to accessing information and gathering the required documents, particularly women. Um, in fact, one woman in the study tried, to, uh, but she was discouraged. She said to me, yes, some time ago I tried um, to access economic reparations, but they asked for this and that document, so I never went back. Um, they explained that the challenges were even greater for women in the town who were illiterate and who lived in remote areas, or um, for those who were single, the single head of the household. One participant, for example, explained the case of her cousin saying, she was 15 when they killed her parents. She was left with three little siblings as a mother and father to those children. Like a widow, she has remained. And what about her? Not even one soul, nothing. Why? Because she hasn't presented her documents. While others probably have more money, they have done their paperwork. While she is busy here because she has no money for her family, she hasn't even had the time. So, as you can see in this comment for participants, the situation of women in this town contrasted to, with those in the community who are close to authorities, who are mostly men. Um, and participants explained that this could be because they had more access to information and also they found less obstacles when gathering their paperwork. And this scenario uh, in this description coincides with what our other studies in this region have been finding as well. So in a way, I think that these experiences seem to be showing that particular groups that are in a more vulnerable position inside these communities, such as women who are, for example, the single, single head of the household are finding greater obstacles to access reparation because in some cases they're not even able to reach the spaces in which they have to start these processes. Um, in terms of collective reparations, um, some collective reparations project uh, have been implemented in this town. And for example, in, in order to determine how the funds of this project will be spent, um, the community has a community assembly. However, community assemblies tend to be male dominated spaces. Um, and this is something that participants confirmed to me. They, they told me that very few women actually express their opinions in these spaces. So they, there are some doubts to the extent to which women's ideas regarding these projects have been actually incorporated. The participants also remembered um, some particular collective reparations projects in the collective workshops that we had together where we discussed this. And they explained to me that many of these projects had failed. For example, there was a chicken farm project in which um, the community members bought chickens, but then one night the chickens disappeared and the community members that were part of this project believed that they were stolen. Um, also, there was a knitting workshop, um, which actually took place in the workshop space where I gathered with the women for this project. And you can see there's like this plate that's in the picture to your right um, with the inscription of the collective reparation delivery. 
Um, but this collective reparation was abandoned by those who joined initially the project after the funds for the project ran out and its members didn't want to invest funds out of their pockets. So I think all these stories, um, in a way, um, I think it's important to take into consideration that in, these, in this community where there have been a certain rupture and previous fragmentation between community ties, um, this might have created some difficulties for collective work. And I think that what has been more painful in listening to these, listening to the stories of these women that wanted to create a collective organization is that according to them, the failure, the failure in these projects seem to reinforce the idea that they can't trust each other when working together in collective projects. Um, but despite this, when I asked them to collectively represent in the workshop, uh, what reparations meant to them, they represented through a collage that you can see on your right, um, collective work. That is, they represented people working together in some form of productive activity, either sewing the fields, making clothing. Um, and I think this in part has to do with the fact that this is the shape that collective reparations projects have taken in the town. However, when I asked them to represent themselves as emotionally repaired, um, you can see in this other picture, they made a drawing of themselves working together in their, in their association. So I think it's important to mention here that in Andean communities, women's works, women's work many times is not seen as work in the same way that men's work. It's not valued in the same way. So maybe that is why for them, it was so important to build an association that would allow them to, to generate some monetary resource um, because it would help them feel repaired and emotionally healed, not only from the harm of the armed conflict, although they did say that working would help them um, not think about the sad memories of the conflict, but it might make them feel good emotionally in a broader way because they would feel more valued in their community because they're bringing an income into their families and into their homes. Um, in terms of reparations for sexual violence, um, it wasn't a topic that I explored directly uh, intentionally in this project because it wasn't the focus of the project. And given how painful these experiences are, I refrained from asking the women about them. However, in my last field trip in the community, um, one of the women did tell me about how the soldiers um, from the military base raped many young women in the town. And she explained to me, it was the soldiers, they raped young women, they came in, what could mom and dad do? They kept quiet. Um, and didn't they file a report, I asked? And they said, to whom were they going to report? Where could they go? They didn't even know their name. Um, so here it's important to consider that the military base had control over the town in those years. So it was practically impossible for the women to report these cases. Um, and as is, as is well documented in many parts of the world, women who experience sexual violence in armed conflicts have great difficulty in sharing these experiences because of the shame and stigma associated to them. And this seemed to be the case in this Indian community, I believe. Also um, in Peru, the, the legal system has managed these cases with great inefficiency and impunity in the past. So, I believe it's in a way understandable for many women to not want to denounce. Um, however, in order to receive some form of reparation, um, the system requires them to do so and in a way to inhabit this rape victim category, which many of them refuse to inhabit. So I believe here that a significant challenge for transitional justice as a field is to think to how to envision how to envision alternative ways to repair women who are survivors of sexual violence that do not necessarily entail such a high risk of revictimization. Um, now, moving into memory, um, in Peru, memory projects and remembrance have gained an important role um, in the past two decades. And after the the Truth Commission delivered its final report mostly promoted by the Truth Commission itself and other human rights organization. And the assumption is that remembering the past wrongs can help a society, can prevent a society from repeating them. Um, and also, there also is a therapeutic value assumed in speaking about past harm. Um, but despite this positive associations in the project, I think in this community in general, 
um, it was particularly challenging for the women um, to speak about the conflict. And most of the participants in this study saw very little sense in doing so. Um, in fact, when I brought the topic up in a collective workshop, it was like a veil of silence fell over the room and it was particularly hard to break that silence, um, which is why most of the information from this study came from the individual interviews. Now, the difficulties in, in remembering the armed conflict, I think, can be partly understood because of how community um, members in this town engaged on both sides of the conflict, sometimes even facing each other. Um, also, the participants explained that those uh, who at some point joined the Shining Path were still in the community. Um, I suspect that maybe it's some of the, the repented members. Um, so in light of this, they had learned not to speak about the war. Um, in fact, one woman mentioned, if you let the other side know that you've spoken about the conflict, they will seek revenge, they can kill, they can take you out of your house. So they are afraid of speaking about the conflict. And in a way, silence becomes a strategy for them, I think, to manage their fears and also to avoid future conflicts. Um, also, participants preferred not speaking about the conflict because of how painful it was for them. They mentioned feeling pain, anger, and resentment towards others when they did remember the conflict. So they preferred not speaking too much about it. Um, and this is something that might be a little bit hard <laughs> and controversial to say, but some women also felt a strong rejection of processes that promoted remembering, such as a truth commission. And I was very shocked to hear some participants say, um, for example, why do I have to remember the things that I have lived, possibly the worst of my life? I am calm and then the Truth Commission starts digging. It makes me remember what I have gone through. It's painful. So many people cry remembering their past and what they've lived through. So in a way, it seems that processes that involved remembering the conflict um, in this community sometimes felt as an imposition, uh, at least for some of these women. So I think that in a way through this stance, women were, um, they were in a way challenging this narrative that favors memory and speech that is sometimes promoted by transitional justice officers, by human rights NGO, by researchers such as myself who want to hear these stories about the conflict. And I felt that in a way, at least with me, they were trying to redirect my attention to issues that for themselves felt, felt more pressing at the moment in the present. Um, But a lot of the women also um, had very interesting stories. Um, so I, I spoke in, a little bit in, in a previous slide about how gender dynamics tend to, to silence stories about sexual abuse in this community. Well, I, these dynamics also might be silencing stories of courage and resistance on part of women, um, usually in anti communities um, that have lived through the conflict, the dominant narrative is one of male heroes. Um, but the women in the study told me many personal experiences of female courage during the war as well. So for example, one woman narrated how her mom protected her during the nights when confrontations were taking place in the town. She said, you know what, my daughter, at night we're going to secure the door with a bar and a mattock. Another woman who was a teacher during the conflict told me about how she and other female colleagues protected their students during the war. And there are, uh, there were a couple of other stories similar to these as well. And I think that these stories show that women did display diverse forms of resistance and courage during the conflict, but that these stories mostly remain silent. Um, however, the fact that these women do recall these stories and share them, even if it's in a close and intimate space, can be interpreted, I think, in a way to challenge this sometimes unidimensional victim position in which many times women affected by conflicts tend to be placed. Um, also, for most women uh, in the study, um, the past was experienced as holding them back. Um, they asserted that to move forward more securely and work together better, they needed to let go of past memories. Um, one woman said to me, all those things that you have lived in relation to the conflict, you have to put aside and try to get ahead. If you're remembering everything, you make yourself fail. 
Also, participants felt that speaking about the conflict have not led to profound changes in their community for Indian women in terms of the conditions of poverty and marginalization in which they lived. And I think here it's important to have in mind what um, a transitional justice scholar, Pablo de Grief, says about how important it is that transitional justice mechanisms be displayed in an articulated way. Um, Unfortunately, here in Peru, there hasn't been such articulation because truth telling and afterwards memory projects have not really been tied to institutional transformations that would lead to a more egalitarian and just society. So in this scenario, it's easier to understand why these women might prefer not to remember the conflict. Um, for, th for them, it seemed that a better way to face the past and try to work and try to um, face the conflicted relationships they had was to try to work together despite them <laughs> in a collective project that in addition could have a material impact on their lives. So to close, just some concluding thoughts. Um, all the challenges that I've presented so far are not a dismissal for memory and remembrance or truth telling <laughs> altogether. Um, that it's not the, the main argument I want to make, of course not. Um, these processes have really important contributions in post-conflict societies. They can help us push for justice. They can help us hold perpetrators accountable. They can also bring into light massive atrocities committed during conflicts. However, I do believe that um, this, the findings from this study have showed me that we need a more nuanced approach to memory and remembrance process. And I think that those of us who are interested in working with communities that are affected by conflict and violence need to be very attentive to the ways in which they prefer to remember and resignify their experiences. For example, in Peru, um, Andean communities have found ways to remember the conflict. For example, through artistic expressions, through drawings, through songs, through craft work, um, among other ways. Um, and in this community, um, remember I mentioned the helicopter earlier, um, they have this huge helicopter in the middle of the town that um, was part of a failed landing of the military those years. And I think that this helicopter seems to play an important role in the way people remember and make memories of the conflict. It's, it's like an informal memory site. Um, and I've heard different stories of how the helicopter got there. Some are even contradictory. Um, but I think that what is significant about this helicopter is that it allows for different and parallel mem memories to coexist. Um, and I think that facilitates telling stories about the conflict. Um, also, this study suggests that I think it's important to pay attention to how transitional justice processes are unfolding locally and how they might be having unintended consequences. For example, the reinforcement of fragmented community ties through the reparations program, and also how this fragmentation might be posing some challenges for particular forms of remembering the conflict. Um, I think these consequences should lead us to look at a more, at more deeper structural issues that might be, might be being left unaddressed. Um, also, the study suggests that gender, racial, and class inequalities are permeating the implementation of both the reparations program and also the memories that are being made publicly of the war. Um, reparations tend to be less accessible to Indian women and their memories of the conflict and the demands that th these memories entail in terms of creating broader forms of gender justice overall remain unaddressed. Um, and if these inequalities are not taking into consideration when designing these projects and following up through the implementation, then they might end up reproducing and reinforcing um, these conditions. So, so yeah, and I'll, I'll leave it there because I've spoken too much. <laughs> Thanks so, yeah, so much, that's, that's um, Gabriella. That was, that was an amazing presentation. Um, we're going to open up um, for questions or comments. Um, are we taking the slides off so we can see everyone? Yeah, of course. Happy to. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. That was that was um really informative and um a great presentation. Thank you so much. It um reminded me a lot of the um 
the Bringing Them Home report in um, Australia, which was a uh, national inquiry into the stolen generations. Um, and there was so many of my friends and their uncles and aunties who went to that national inquiry and spoke to the commissioners there and told their stories for the first time and, and almost broke down after they told their stories and then sort of went, well, you know, they're going to do all this really great stuff now. They're going to create some healing centres and, like, because you know, that was really important to where we're going to go and there'll be reparations and, you know, this will, this will actually end all of this happening. And it's almost the same storyline, what you were talking about in terms of the bureaucracy and how it just um, doesn't enable anything to happen or things to move. I don't know that anybody got any money out of that. I think in Victoria there might have been one cultural space set up, but it was like 10 years later under a completely different program. Um, and people sort of wandered away from that and just fell apart again because they told their story and felt they weren't listened to. And so, um, so it's really interesting to see those, those sort of similarities. Um, but I guess, and, and the reason I was mostly interested to come today is I'm part of what's now called the Uruk um, Truth and Justice Commission in Victoria, which is part of our treaty um, assembly work. And um, yeah, I just think it's really important to understand this, this notion of how you describe a victim and, and how they're enabled to participate in such a process. Um, so it'd be interesting to have some more conversations about how the commission in, in um, Peru sort of defines victims. But yeah, that notion around gender and, and how, to, how to make sure people are enabled to feel like they're important enough to participate is a, is a really hard space to get into. Um, yeah, and I guess so the authorities, and so here it'll be like state government and, and how do you push back in those spaces to, I don't, that's a really tricky space. I don't, I don't know if you have any other suggestions. I mean, you had some great suggestions at the end, but they're sort of, yeah, they're the sorts of things that are doing my head in at the moment. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, is it KJ? Yeah, yeah. Or Karen, yeah, whichever. Yeah. Karen, thank you so much, Karen, for for your comment. I think what what is, what is tricky and it's something that I've been thinking about is that sometimes in, when we think about victims, it's really hard to not. Um, we constantly, I think, have to push back against this idea of seeing them as just one homogeneous group, because within the victims there are so many power dynamics going on and the voices of some that get heard are not are in a way not letting others to be heard so there are so many differences um, mm. in terms of how people live the conflict and sometimes a lot of stories are unattended um, and that tends to reinforce more this feeling of being damaged um, or what what was it for like what was it all for yeah. I told all these stories and with telling stories there is so much expectation created um, so then the harm is is even worse. Um, can yeah. be sometimes worse. so. Have to be very careful with managing those expectations, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, I would love to keep talking about that. Yeah. But I think there's another hand. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Uh, uh, hey, Tom and Tom and. Sorry, there are two. I think you uh, Tom, go. I think. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, so thank you and. Thank you, Priya. Uh, no, um, uh, while we're thinking, uh, Gabriella, thank you for a, a fascinating presentation. I've just, you know, the um, the, the kind of tr the, the truth on the ground is uh, mm -hmm. is something we've really got to kind of look out for from a place like Australia. But also, I think I mean what KJ is dealing with Europe too, right? The truth on the ground is something you've all got always got to look out for, even when it's all around you. You've, you've the, 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 the the truth takes active active work. Um, and it's re I was fascinated just then to hear um, Yuruk talking to the Peruvian experience and, and vice versa. That's, that, that, could, that could be a really important line of dialogue, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so, so, do you know, the, the, this, I hope this doesn't seem self-indulgent. I, like, I, I, I mean it very respectfully. It's a, I'm, I'm always fascinated with the, the aesthetics of public discourse because it's so much easier for us to engage with content and, and it feels frivolous or, or unimportant to engage with form. <clears throat> but in, um, 
I, uh, I, I've done some research on, on the Canadian truth and reconciliation process as well, and others here have done, have done work on that and on plenty of other TRPs around the world. Um, and one thing that struck me in, in the hearings, in the public hearings at the, at the, at the TRC's uh, inaugural event, for example, in Winnipeg, was this, was it uh, watching and listening to people uh, KJ, I'm going to misquote your words, but you know, kind of, kind of, kind of um, breaking in front of us, yeah. And um, and I, I had a very uneasy feeling about that, you know, as a, as a foreigner and also as as a pretty waspy kind of person with a with a pretty waspy kind of surname and a pretty waspy kind of you know <laughs> background in sandstone universities and stuff. Um, I, I felt deeply uncomfortable about this obligation that survivors. S had, maybe I was reading it wrongly, but it felt like survivors were being expected to role play the traumatized. And so there, there was some kind of public obligation to go through the process of breaking down in front of us. And, and I'm, I'm still scarred by hearing some of the stories. Like it's really, really awful stuff, but the, the really awful bits that stick in memory are, are people's voices and, and you know, and, and they're kind of looping narratives as you, as you kind of, you, you, you're so kind of palpably exposed to to psychological dysfunction being played out in the in the view of a whole nation, right? Yeah. Do you do you have a sense of of those kinds of dynamics in the Peruvian case? What is you you were talk, you were talking about uh, about about the hearings and, and the truth telling? H how does that idea of, of an obligation to perform your own personal breakdown? How does how does that how does that kind of play out in the Peruvian situation? Well, I think it was really present, like when, when the commission hearings took place, um, these stories in which, um, and these situations in which the victims um, also break down in front of everybody. And it was it, it was very present. And of course, I, I, th there's also been a lot written about the dynamics created around, um, and I, again, I think I'm repeating myself, but what are the expectations of people telling these stories? And what are the expectations of people listening in terms of what they can do with their listening? And I, I read a really interesting article. I can't remember right now the title. Um, I think it was Jal Boyston, who works a lot in um, transitional justice in Peru, but I'll, I'll look at that article if not, if I can find it. Um, but she spoke about how for the victims, it seemed to be like, I'll tell you my story and you'll give me your indignation because indignation is a feeling that is closer to action. But for the people who are listening, the commissioners, it was more, give me your story and I'll give you my sympathy um, and my and kind of my like pity. Um, and there was a disconnect between what function that story was, was, was uh, playing out in a way um, so I think that was something that really struck me. Um, and, and I think that a lot of times when, when you hear people not wanting to tell those stories, um, and this is partly what motivated me to, to do this study is that this like, like as a psychology professional, you come with this idea that speaking about um, painful experiences is gonna help you. Um, and it's important to make memory about these the difficult situations. Um, but then again, when you find people that push back against that with a really strong affirmation, I think that's also important because it, in a way it gives them control of not wanting to be the victim that you want me to be. Um, and I think that's really powerful for them as well. So, yeah. Yeah. For you, for you, Angela. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad, Chris, that you invited me. Um, it was really exciting to hear your work, Gabriella, um, and the richness and the real sort of vulnerability in your own research processes as well in doing this work. And I think that um, that really stood out to me, your process. Um, and I have lots of different thoughts. Normally, I never put up my hand to speak because I often think that people just put up their hands because they want to say stuff and it's not a question. But I really mm -hmm. want to be in a conversation with you because I think this is so interesting in terms of what KJ and Tom also said about the connections between um, where we can actually find the intersections and the dialogue with your rook here, with things going on in Canada. But I wanted to talk about something I'm working on with um, 
artists in India around the this question of we haven't even got to the 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 state of reconciliation. You know, um, we're actually looking at um, you know artists who are have been silenced in the 20th century due to colonialism and due to nationalism and patriarchy within the communities of these artists that these women come from. And mm -hmm. they're still, because a, a stigma of sexuality and, you know, they were presumed to be prostitutes, their forms were destroyed and then recovered on the bodies of middle and upper caste, middle class women's bodies. Um, and, and I'm an inheritor of this history. And so I've been really looking at how do we go back and have these conversations with the women who come from these um, backgrounds, who come from these lineages, but have, have been silenced and, and continue to be silent. Um, they don't mm -hmm. wanna talk. They really just wanna be um, you know, part of everyday culture. They wanna be assimilated to a certain mm -hmm. extent. And some wanna speak about it, but don't have the tools because mm -hmm. the, the, the language is not there for what does reconciliation actually translate to and so I think I'm really interested in how could we actually talk about that? What could reconciliation look like through the act of performance? Because for mm -hmm. them, it may not actually be telling oral stories, but it may actually be through performative acts and that actually give them sort of different kinds of power positions than orality, because orality has its own sort of benefits and also struggles I feel like orality can be very powerful, but it can also be quite um, silencing at the same time. So how can the body that has been really sort of maligned and really disavowed, that female hypersexualized, so-called hypersexualized body, how can that be recovered? And what are the traces through which it can be engaged with? Um, yeah, and I'm, in fact, when you were even presenting, I was, um, my friend from India had called and we're working on this. And I said to her, oh my God, this is so exciting. You have to actually listen to what's going on elsewhere to see what kind of processes you could actually in, engage with and, and sort of um, get on board with. So yeah, I mean, it, it's just more around how do you look at performative silences um, mm -hmm. that, that, that don't necessarily look for pity, sympathy, indignation, but call to action, like what, mm -hmm. what, could that, what could that look like and does that have a place in some of the work that you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. But thank you again, really excellent mm -hmm. and rich, um, really rich work to discuss and think through. Thank you, Priya. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm thinking like in terms of the work that I did, um, we did do a lot of work through creative arts um, that is not part of this. Um, that not that much part of this presentation exists specifically because it was very difficult to, to talk about these things collectively. Um, so when I think of silences, um, for me specifically, timing was 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 a big part of the issue. Um, and I'm saying this because I remember when I and when I first got to the community, like I was speaking to the women about certain topics, but as the months moved forward and I was about to leave, they were able to tell me other stories, I think in part because I was not gonna stay in the community. So I feel that there was a way in which they didn't want their stories to stay in the community through me. But when I was about to leave on my last trip, they kind of dropped bombs on me in terms of the stories they were telling me. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe you just waited till the last minute to do this. Um, so I, I think that it has to do with where is the story going to be? Like, where is it going to live? Um, and, in, and through what way, you know, through what um, format, I think. Um, and this is something that has also happened to um, an, an advisee of my, a master's student that I'm advising her dissertation that is working in a community very close to where this community is. And it happened to her as well. Like when she was about to leave, um, women were willing to talk to her, um, I think in the last day or the previous night. Um, so I think sometimes it has to do with who is gonna know your story and what they can do with it. Um, and I think that in a way that speaks a little bit about the timings and the silences. Um, in terms of performative work, 
I think that work, work that can be very helpful is the accompaniment of Mayan women that have, has been taking place in Guatemala with a case of Serpur Sargo, which is a case that um, Merton Likes has worked on. And they have worked with a lot of Mayan practices that use the body. And it has been a very long process of accompanying these group of, of women, of indigenous women in Guatemala who were victims of sexual violence um, that engage with their body in different ways. And they kind of learn to relate to their body in a different way. Um, so that's an experience interesting to look at. Um, but I think in terms of performing, um, I think there's a lot to look in terms of daily practices and sometimes it really depends on the community, but in, in Huancasancos, there were a lot of traditional festivities that I, I haven't looked too close at, but I think that they do have an important meaning in terms of how to reconcile stories um, that are told through these traditional festivities in a way sometimes that is, there's an agreement, but not an explicit agreement. Um, but the stories that are played out through traditions find a way to play out in a way that are not that evident. So, so yeah. Thanks, Bria, for those comments. Um, and before we go to Angela, I just want to um, remind everyone that um, we are coming to the end of the presentation, but we're happy to kind of stay back and, and continue the conversation um, if you're all happy to, to stay. But yeah, Angela. Thanks, Roshani. Um, I think I was just going to make a quick comment of um, how interesting your findings are and also putting it into top context with the actual Colombian peace treaty that was signed just five years ago and we're still kind of in this process of hearing women's stories and even hearing stories from you know it's a war that's been going on for 50 years so stories of um, that had happened 50 years ago and they're just able to to you know share it um, but I was just wondering if uh, if you came across on your findings, if women might not want to register in the reparation system due to the fear that they have from being recognized and probably target of further violence by the state or the community. Yeah, I did find that a lot. Um, some community, some, some of the women told me that um, that there were other women in the community and community members who did not approach the reparation program because that, that could place them, um, it could be seen as if they were denouncing who was a perpetrator of their violence and that would be putting them at risk, um, especially when the perpetrator was somebody of the military. So in a way, if you are a victim of the military and at least in, in Andean communities, most of the time you have greater constraints and you refrain more from denouncing because they have this fear that somebody from the military might find out and might come to, to, to look for me. So, so yeah, I did find that a lot. Thanks, Gabriela. And I think it, um, I think it's just a last reflection. reflection. Um, we don't other scholars, she also um, did a study with um, indigenous women and were campusing as women in Colombia. And we mm -hmm. kind of both came up with this uh, reflex, reflection of uh, decol like decolonizing femi like feminism um, while working with them. Uh, and I think it's also something that came across that um, you sharing that vulnerability working with them, which um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate for your honesty and, and sharing those journeys with us. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Roshani, I do just have one more question. One I would more, yes. Faye, Faye. One more hand up. There you go. Okay. Sorry, it's very last minute. Um, <laughs> thank you, Gabby. So happy to meet you again here and hear yeah. that you're actually doing this research because it's very similar to what I started in 2018 and hoping to do it as my dissertation. Um, yeah, so what happened uh, is, so what I'm doing is something in, in Indonesia. So I'm from Indonesia. Um, the context in, is in Aceh, where I come from. So this study is very close to home. I think the findings are a lot very similar in the economic part, um, but sadly, unfortunately, we're not there yet with the transitional justice. The TRC was only had like two public hearings and that was it, a lot of political tensions. And even it took like 10 years for them to start one um, because they say it's like rocking the boat. 
um, for the political tensions between Aceh and like Indonesia or like the province and the national government. Um, maybe we're gonna have to have another talk for this, but I just wanna ask about, because um, continuing what Angela said, how do you feel safe doing this study? How do you emotionally cope with doing something like this? <laughs> Good question. I had, it's, it was very hard for me. I was only there for two weeks. It was very hard for me. Uh -huh. um, and I also want to ask the PAR part, the participatory mm -hmm. action research part, um, just to have it to an idea of maybe that's a lot of things to ask too. But yeah, mm -hmm. just thing. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I think the coping part was mostly um, I I uh, I had enough funds, thank goodness, to um, hire a, a translator who ended up being a research assistant and a dear friend, um, who is a young anthropologist um, called Raimeria. She's from Ayacucho herself, from another area. Um, and she was really like a, an important support for me during my field work. Like I would not recommend doing field work on your own in such tense uh, places because you really need somebody to talk at night about what happened, what went on. Um, so I think that was very helpful. Um, I didn't spend 18 months straight. Like I went every month um, and spent about 10 days or 15 days sometimes. Um, so, and it, it, so it wasn't like 18 months completely, but when I was there, it did become pretty intense, but I found like a group of friends in the community. And I think that letting yourself being accompanied by people of the community as well is also, is also something that really is helpful and supportive. Um, and just very briefly, the PAR process, um, it was mostly through collective workshops where we used creative techniques and discussed um, what came out of them. It, it was, a, a, they were about a, a bunch of other topics that are not presented here. This is like one third of what came out of the dissertation. Um, but uh, I, I can send you some some other documents that I, that I, well, not that many, but I think I've written an article that explains a little bit more the process, the part process, and I'm happy to share it with you. So, yep. Debbie, uh, no, uh, yeah. did you want to say anything else, Roshani? No, no, all good. But um, yeah, if, if Gabby wants to kind of like end with some reflections of hers, um, she can. But thank you so much for sharing your work, Gabrielle, and thanks for everybody, mm -hmm. um, everyone joining the conversation and joining the discussion. It was, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much for the invitation. And I would be really happy to, to reconnect with, um, with all <laughs> other of you who are um, doing, doing this work and who want to think together about these these so complex processes, because I think that um, sharing previous experiences is a way to try to build something new and um, try to not repeat previous uh, mistakes of the past, or at least trying to work towards towards making them better. So I would be happy to, to meet with, with other people who have been here today. So, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah Gabby, thank you very much for, for doing that. I, I know that it's your evening um, time. Um, also, um, you can see that KJ has put a note in there. KJ is also the um, Associate Provost and Director of Mandani Balak, and they've got, as she said, they've got some processes in place around reconciliation and truth-telling um, soon. Um, um, that, yeah, that, that, and so it will be good for you. Uh, I, I, I should be very interested in those sorts of links. We also have made some connections back into my home country with South Africa. And Tom has mentioned some of his work that he's done. Um, so I don't know if you know Puleng, but Puleng Sagalo. Um, yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've shared a panel with her. Yeah, so, so Puleng will also at some point speak to this to, to this group. So it will be, be neat. I'll, I'll put you on the mailing list. And Faye, I'll, I can put you on the mailing list too if you're interested. And we, we try and have the talks at, the, at this time because I know that we can get uh, people from different um, countries uh, involved when we uh, when we organize it around this time of the day. But yeah, but look, just uh, th thank you for that, and and yeah, I really look forward to um, to thinking with you um, as we as as we engage with this. Was it the decolonial turn a little bit more um, as well, um, and especially the, the the different sorts of ways in which. Um, Indigenous, uh, indigenous people, I think, um, place 
place and reconciliation or place making and reconciliation and those sorts of um, um, intersections there. Um, how you think about that? Because I have some questions around those sorts of things. But but thank thank you very much, um, Gabby, for for doing this. We really uh, appreciate that we can have this dialogue um, and conversation across the. <laughs> th thanks to Zoom, <laughs> thanks to the pandemic, <laughs> in an odd sort of way. Um, that allows us to connect in this way. So yeah, so really thank you and and welcome to this um, collective of people trying to do this um, um, to have these conversations across across borders. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thank, thank you everyone you for, for having... coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you everybody. It's, it's nice to see you. And I'm taking notes of the emails in the chat so I can I can write to some of you later.